Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Hey, hey, what is up, good Twimmel people? Before we jump into today's show from our CVPR series, I'd like to share a few quick details about the next great event in our continuing live discussion series. Join us on Wednesday, July 1st for the great machine learning language undebate as we explore the strengths, weaknesses, and approaches of both popular and emerging programming languages for machine learning. We'll have great speakers representing Python, R, Swift, Clojure, Scala, Julia, and more. The session kicks off at 11 a.m. Pacific time on the 1st, and you won't want to miss it, so head over to twimmelai.com languages to get registered. At this point, I'd like to send a huge thank you to our friends at Qualcomm for their support of this podcast and their sponsorship of our CVPR series. Qualcomm AI Research is dedicated to advancing AI to make its core capabilities, perception, reasoning, and action ubiquitous across devices. Their work makes it possible for billions of users around the world to have AI-enhanced experiences on Qualcomm Technologies powered devices. To learn more about Qualcomm and what they're up to on the AI research front, visit twimmelai.com slash Qualcomm. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am here with Hima Lakaraju. Hima is an assistant professor at Harvard University with joint appointments in both the business school and the Department of Computer Science. Hima, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm super excited to be here. Same here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We will start where we typically do uh, on the show and have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in machine learning, in particular, uh, your focus on fair and interpretable ML and uh, the implications in kind of uh, mission critical high stakes domains like criminal justice, healthcare, and public policy. How'd you get started in all this? Uh, <laughs> so that's actually an interesting story. Let me try and you know kind of summarize it in a uh, hopefully fewer sentences <laughs> so that we are not hogging all the time here. So yeah, I was actually uh, working in machine learning, right? So basically I come from India. I moved to the United States for my PhD in 2012. Um, I have been working in machine learning since I was a student in India. Uh, I was publishing actively in machine learning, but my interest in sort of the applications of machine learning to some of these domains like criminal justice or healthcare, uh, that sort of started or it became a prominent thread in my research when I started my PhD. And uh, this was, I guess, mostly due to uh, a collaboration now between my advisor and uh, another professor, uh, another couple of professors in economics who were dealing with behavioral economics. And they sort of introduced us to all these fascinating problems. As I was sort of, I think by then I had already explored machine learning to a reasonable extent. And I was looking for applications which were more than just like ad recommendations or, uh, you know, friendship recommendations and so on, so that I could keep myself going in the field and also anchor on to something uh, which is more uh, applied in the sense of like real world settings and so on. So I guess my PhD was like one of the, uh, you know, main uh, times in my life where I got into both machine learning as well as its applications to some of these domains, which are super fascinating, and the broad field of uh, fairness and interpretability in ML. Yeah. You know, I suspect when we dig into your upcoming, well, actually, your recent uh, talk at CVPR, where you were an invited speaker in the Fair, Data Efficient, and Trusted Computer Vision Workshop. Yeah. Uh, we will learn about uh, a bit of your research, uh, but kind of broadly, how do you frame out the the kinds of questions that you're looking to answer with your work? Right. I guess uh, in a broad sense, the way I think about my research is it's about 
enabling machine learning to help with decision making in high stakes settings right and that involves some sub questions like how can we make sure that uh, machine learning models which are of course getting more and more complex day by day are uh, in a more palatable form to these decision makers who are not necessarily experts in machine learning so how do we sort of explain these models what are the algorithms that we can use which can in turn explain these models to people who are not machine learning experts so that's of course one of the key questions and also uh, the core question behind interpretable ml right and beyond that when we develop some of these tools which will assist uh, the decision makers and important decisions how do we ensure that the tools or the algorithms that we are developing are by default fair otherwise they can induce their own discriminatory biases and undesirable biases into the entire real world decision making so that's of course another question and more broadly also just trying to develop models and methods to understand what kinds of biases exist as of now uh, in human decision making like even if there was no algorithm involved in the picture as well as how to diagnose biases if someone gives me an algorithm what is the best way to do that so these are roughly the broad questions i think about and so your talk is titled understanding the limits of explainability in ml assisted decision making and there are some interesting tidbits that I'm looking forward to digging into around like some of the explainability algorithms like Lime and Chat. But before we even do that, thinking about the topic of your talk and the workshop makes me think of a podcast that I did with Cynthia Rudin last year. And you know, her perspective seems to come from a different direction, which is, you know, we shouldn't even be using black box models for the kinds of problems that you're studying. Right. We should be using models that are kind of more fundamentally understandable. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, in, in many conversations I've had in this topic, there's this tension between explainability, interpretability, and, you know, just Accuracy. Being, yep. and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, kind of out of the gate, what's your take on all that? Oh, that's an, uh, I think we are already starting with a very interesting and controversial uh, topic. But uh, yeah, uh, I mean, Cynthia has been a mentor and a collaborator for several years, but we somehow managed to coexist uh, with this dichotomy. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, I mean, so I agree with this point, or rather my take on this would be that if at all it is possible for you to develop a model that is interpretable by default and is also accurate and you have the data to build such a model by all means you should go for it right so because there are no barriers here but unfortunately the real world is always not like that so in some cases you may not have enough training data for example to build a disease diagnosis model right so you might be then using another proprietary model that some other company has built and in that case you would still want to do some diagnostic checks to ensure that the model is you know doing what it's supposed to do and it's the way it's making predictions is reasonable and so on so those those are the kinds of cases where explaining a given model or a black box model, as we are calling it, you know, is probably the only option, right? So because you don't have the ability to sort of build such a model because of lack of data or resources and uh, empty number of other reasons, but you have the capability to buy or get this model from a third party, but you still want to vet it or understand what's roughly going on with the tiny bit of data that you have or like just doing some diagnostic checks with whatever little amount of data that you have, which may not be enough to develop an accurate model, but at the same time might be you know, decent enough to sort of vet a given model. So if that is the context you're dealing with, then essentially explaining or understanding what the black box might be doing is probably the only option. So these are, of course, like, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, these are constraints that is, arise in the real world. And that's what we are sort of thinking about. But yes, if you have the means to develop an interpretable model from scratch, you have all the data, you have the necessary means, I think that is definitely, and it's also accurate, of course. So that is definitely the way to go. But just that there are many other real world context where that might not be the case uh, which you could actually perceive yeah in the the scenarios where you can't 
do something that is more fundamentally transparent and you're doing something that's a black box and you want to explain it, uh, there are you know some kind of known and popular methods for achieving some level of uh, explainability. And I mentioned a couple of those already, right. Lime and SHAP. Yeah. But a part of your presentation references some previous research that you've done that has shown that, you know, that work can be vulnerable to attack. Mm -hmm. You know, with your presentation, what what's kind of the broad landscape that you're looking to to carve out? And yeah. we'll get to the the particulars of of Lyme and Chap when we get to them. Um, sure. But you know, how do you how do you kind of frame the you know, the problem of kind of understanding the limits of the explainability tools. Yeah. So I think this talk and more broadly, my recent research has uh, uh, been kind of exploring as we are thinking about the limits of explainability. And what I mean by that is, um, so far, at least in the past few years, there has been a lot of interest in coming up with new algorithms which can explain black boxes, right? So there is like uh -huh. a huge research that has built up, I think, since 2016, pretty much like paper on top of paper. So every paper comes up with uh, another new method for explaining a given black box classifier or a prediction model. So one of the things that as we were seeing more and more work on this topic uh, that you know, me and some of my collaborators of this work, we got excited about is how to now start thinking about what are all the ways in which these explanation techniques can be gamed or potentially even unintentionally uh, misused to sort of generate mm -hmm. explanations which could uh, fool people or mislead end users into trusting something that they should not trust. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, maybe if your explanation, basically, if your model, let's say, if you have a black box model, which uh, is actually using, you know, lace or gender, some of these sensitive features, which are prohibited to be the key aspects for making, you know, critical decisions, like, for example, uh, who gets a bail or who gets a loan and so on. Yeah. So, if a black box model is using some of these features, and if your explanation is somehow misled to sort of think that that's not the feature that it is using, but instead it's using another correlate, for example, a zip code, when making prediction, an end user might look at this explanation and just be misled that, oh, this seems like a model that's not using race, it's not racially biased, it's using other correlates, so maybe it's fine to deploy it, right? Mm -hmm. So an explanation that can be misleading in terms of explaining what the black box is doing can have serious consequences in the real world, as we can just see with this kind of example, right? Yeah. Uh, so the line of work that I'm pursuing currently is how to identify some of the issues or vulnerabilities of existing methods, which can potentially lead to these kinds of misleading explanations, and also understanding what is a real world impact if there is a misleading explanation. So what would be the consequences of that in real world? And for that, I'm also doing a bunch of user studies with students from law schools and uh, you know, healthcare professionals and so on to see how a misleading explanation can affect their work. This uh, is pretty much what the talk is all about. Yeah. Got it. I, I've got to imagine that the effects of these misleading explanations vary pretty dramatically depending on the, the setting in which they're used. That is definitely true. Yeah, I, I think, uh, like, for example, I think, you know, since anyways, we are discussing this, let me segue a bit into the second part of this talk, which essentially talks about the effects of these ex explanations in a particular context. And the context we are looking at is, uh, let's say, if there is a, a model that is, uh, you know, designed to predict who should get a bail, right? Or at mm -hmm. least it's designed to assist a judge in determining who should get a bail. But in the process, the model is also making predictions as to who should get a bail, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so before such a model is even deployed in the real world, ideally the judges or the teams of the people, it'll definitely go through a lot of vetting and people would like to look at what the model is exactly doing before they sort of decide to trust and deploy it in some sense, right? Yeah. Uh, so in 
in that context, we designed a small experiment with law school students. Of course, this is all proxy because, uh, you know, the time uh, from judges and these senior domain experts is their time is much more valuable and it's not easily available. So we were trying to sort of mimic that, but in, with the uh, with law school students here at Harvard and UConn. And uh, basically what we did was we essentially built like a simple uh, in fact, Cynthia Rudin style rule based model, which is the actual black box, which explicitly has some rules which are used to determine who gets a bail or not. Okay. And in that, we specifically used all these bad features or undesirable features like race or gender to determine who gets a bail. And then we constructed an explanation for this rule based model, which is another set of rules. And then in that, we explicitly avoided the usage of the features race and gender, but the explanation is free to replace it with its correlates, like replace these features with its correlates. So race could be substituted by zip code or anything else, but the explanation is just kind of not allowed to show race or gender explicitly, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still, it should still make the same predictions as what would be made by the original black box model that we constructed. And so, was this an actual system System that generated these explanations or was this, you know, did you create these explanations to simulate what a system might do under the set of conditions that you outlined? So one of the existing techniques is what we use to generate the explanations for okay. this black box. So okay. it's just that we put an additional constraint on that technique that just make sure that race or gender do not show up in the explanations. Got it. Now, the experiment was uh, something that revealed very insightful uh, things to us, which is uh, we showed we basically split people into a couple of groups. Or we took a bunch of law school students. We split them into two groups. For one set of people, we showed the actual model, which has race and gender. And then we asked them if this is the model or if this is an explanation of a model, which is showing you that race and gender are being used in making the you know, mm -hmm. these predictions of who should be jail. Uh, would you trust this model enough to deploy it in your court if you were a judge, assuming you were a judge, right? And most of the people, of course, as expected, said, no, the model is using race and gender. I don't want it deployed anywhere close to me. Uh, sorry. But then when we gave them the explanation, which was tailored to sort of hide or cover up some of these problematic features and then showed it to the other half of the people. And we said, this is an explanation generated by state of the art machine learning to uh, explain a black box. <laughs> Using this, now do you trust the underlying model enough to deploy it? And most people said, yeah, sure, because it seems to be doing something which reasonably matches my intuition of how, uh, you know, we should determine someone should be given a bail or not. I don't see usage of any prohibited features or problematic features. Yeah, sure, let's go ahead. So the actual true model, less than 10% of the people trusted it. And the explanation that we had generated, which is essentially doing the same thing, but replacing race and gender with its correlates, almost about 80% plus people trusted it. Oh, wow. um, so it also reminds me a little bit of some experiments that Ayanna Howard shared with me and her about her research into just the authority that we tend to confer yes. on computing systems, in her case, robots. Robots, yeah. Um, and the examples that she gave were, you know, a robot that is uh, presumably supposed to lead you out of a, a fire or a dangerous condition in a building. You will like stand behind it, banging itself against the wall and waiting for it to, you know, all of a sudden yeah. do the right thing because we just want to believe that these things are, you know, more infallible than they than they are. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. I think this research, I guess, also fits in line with some of that work in the sense that people are probably already approaching models and model explanations from the perspective of some prior trust, right? So they are already willing to sort of trust them, which is why some of these, uh, you know, issues are like the things that we are seeing uh, are actually being seen. So, yeah. And realizing we've kind of jumped ahead to the, the yes. end of your talk, um, but did you further explore around, you know, different ways to present that result that, um, you know, helped, you know, besides from, you know, the, the, the one example where you kind of show the, the, the race and the other where you hide it, yep. gender, are there things that you've played with, like showing the, the different correlating features or other things that can help? 
um, right. the human understand what's really happening? Yeah, so that's actually the ongoing research that we okay. are actually doing, which is what is the best way in which we can educate people that, hey, the explanation that you saw, it is purely correlational. And it's like when it says that zip code is being used, it could essentially mean that any zip code or its correlate could be actually used to make predictions, right? And in fact, uh, one thing is we design like a very a short five to 10 minute, like a primer or tutorial, just highlighting some of the examples that just because you don't see race, uh, you know, it could still be present because the correlation between race and zip code is like greater than 0.8 or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then designing some examples like these, uh, and it's a very short 10 minute tutorial. And using that, we can already see some, you know, like, mega improvements in terms of how people already like latched on to some of those ideas and the next time we ask them uh, a similar question they are like less likely to make this kind of a mistake so we are also just awesome. kind of thinking about what training is uh, might help people in like realizing some of these things because again uh, what we are designing or you know even the way that we are sort of producing these explanations our intention is that they would be used by someone who is not an expert in machine learning so we should also be prepared to teach them how to think about these explanations and what they can or they cannot provide in terms of information. So I guess that's the next step or the next research that we are conducting. And again, going back to your earlier question, we are also looking at this, of course, one scenario as we talked about where misleading explanations had this impact. We are also looking at other scenarios, again, in healthcare and uh, a bit in like the business domains uh, where we are looking at different kinds of decisions, like some of which are more high stakes, the others which are a bit more low stakes. So in those cases, what would be the implications of misleading explanations? Yeah. So let's maybe take a few steps back and yeah. talk a little bit about the explainability techniques that you know you're seeing in use and you know where you're seeing them in use. Have you done a kind of a, a survey of the, the various techniques and how they're being used in practice. I know you talk specifically about Lyme and SHAP, and I hear those come up probably more than any others, but I'm yeah. wondering if you, you've looked broadly at that. Yeah. Uh, so while it's not an active area of my research, uh, so there are, I think, some other uh, folks who are like sort of thinking about these things. But in general, you're right that these two techniques, one of the reasons we also picked those was because, you know, they were being very widely used in practice in industry and in uh, other real world settings. So that was also one reason to sort of uh, see if there are any vulnerabilities in those first because they're so widely used. Uh, beyond that also, there are like several techniques which are probably much less popular, but they try to address some of the issues that are present in the first two techniques, uh, Lime and Shab. Uh, just to name a few, for example, like Maple is another approach that has been uh, proposed, which tries to sort of get rid of some of the you know, like somewhat of an ad hoc perturbations or like some of the ad hoc uh, pieces within Lime and sort of make them more systematic. So that's another approach, uh, just to give an example. And of course, there are like several more, uh, which are like, you know, Muse and a bunch of other things, anchors and so on. So there has been a lot of work just built up on, you know, this entire explaining black boxes, as I said, like since 2016. So by now there are countless approaches, but I think the well-known ones among the most well-known among these are uh, Lime and Shap. Now coming to the second part of your question where you're thinking about how are people using these techniques? Uh, honestly, the domains that I look at, uh, so we are still kind of uh, trying to make decision makers like doctors or judges kind of aware of these techniques and how they should even use them. So, but that's the domains that, you know, I deal with a lot, but I can easily imagine that if you're looking at, you know, maybe a startup or a tech company and so on, their people are like more widely, uh, you know, more well familiar with these kinds of techniques and they may already be using, be using some of them uh, in their day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, job, whether as a developer or an engineer or a scientist, you are trying to understand what a particular model is doing, maybe to deal bug the model and so on. So I can imagine all those kinds of use cases uh, 
already underway and you know where explainability is becoming a you know playing a bigger role in uh, practice in day to day uh, applications but yeah the domains that i deal with like especially where you are sort of a bit more detached from you know the core machine learning you're dealing with uh, people who make different kinds of decisions they are not tech people they are not experts so it is like these kinds of approaches are sort of like reaching them at this point barely i would say mm-hmm. yeah in your talk, did you kind of go over how the the different techniques work, and you know what some of the you know weaknesses or blind spots that um, are inherent to them are, and where they come from? Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, the first part of this talk is mainly about what are the weaknesses of Lyman Sharp, and just to kind of think about more broadly. Uh, the explanation techniques, uh, you can roughly characterize them into like two uh, categories. So one is local explanation methods and the other is global explanation methods. I guess as the name suggests, local means, uh, you know, you just think of explaining a complex behavior uh, only with within a particular tiny locality or neighborhood in the data, right? So a small piece of the feature space, you are trying to explain what the model is doing there as best as you can. So that's the local explanation methods. And then the global explanation methods is you somehow want to give an in the, pic, the uh, entire picture of what the black box model might be doing, like the whole big picture, you know, so that like someone, like for example, the use cases of these two could be different, where in the case of global explanation, the idea would be that someone who is deciding if a model is good enough or whether it should be deployed, like maybe a team of judges or, you know, a a stakeholder who has a lot of authority on deciding if some model should be deployed or not. He or she might use those to vet and decide, is this model even reasonable enough to deploy, right? So that's where the global explanations come into picture because you're giving like a, a zoomed out view of what the model's behavior looks like, right? On the other hand, when you think of local explanations, it could be to just like as a model is deployed or after a model is deployed, let's say in a hospital to diagnose a disease or something, for every patient, the model will give you a particular, you know, diagnosis uh, saying that this is basically what the diagnosis should be, say someone has diabetes or not, for example, right? So in such cases, you also want to get an explanation for why that prediction is made the way it is. So right. there we focus more on the local or instance level or like singular predictions, whereas, and that's the case where after a model is deployed, a doctor is just double checking that a, a single prediction makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the use case. And then for the global, it is to decide if a model at a high level is even good enough to sort of be deployed. And so do the local and global uh, methods share the same weaknesses or, or issues or are they different? Yeah. So in fact, the weaknesses are specific to the exact techniques employed to generate a global or local explanation. Like, for example, uh, the first part of my talk is broadly focusing on what is called as perturbation-based methods, right? And I'll get into the details of what I mean by that a bit. Then there are other methods which focus on uh, you know, kind of using gradients to sort of determine what features are being used when making a prediction. So the attacks, these two classes of techniques have are vulnerable to different kinds of attacks. So the same attack would not work both for the perturbation-based methods uh, as well as the gradient-based methods. So yeah, the attacks are specific to the exact uh, techniques that these methods are using. So they are much more finely uh, fine-grained than even just local and global. Yeah. Okay. And so in the case of a perturbation type of method like Lime, yep. what does the attack look like? How, do, how, how are those attacks constructed? Right. So let me, I think, start by just giving an intuition about what Lime does so that it becomes clear what the attack would look like, right? So what Lime does is uh, it is trying to, at a very basic or code level, Lime is trying to explain individual predictions of classifier. So for each prediction, it's trying to give you uh, which features were important and what was their weightage in uh, making this prediction, right? So now what Lime does is it goes to sort of every data point. So basically, if we want uh, to explain a prediction of a particular data point, Lime takes that data point 
And then it sort of perturbs that data point. And when I say that, think of it as like you add some noise to different features of this data point, okay? And then that's what we call as perturbation. So you just kind of slightly massage the values of these data points, generate another artificial data point, and keep doing this until you have a bunch of data points which were result which resulted from perturbing that initial instance or the data point you wanted to explain right so now that we have let's say we got 100 such perturbations or massage data points and then you have this actual data point that you wanted to explain now think of it as you just build a linear regression model on top of this so that that model is predicting what the black box models predictions are for these 100 data points okay mm -hmm. so it's basically take a data point, massage it to create some artificial data set around the data point. Now just fit a regression model and then it will give you what are the feature importance weights for each of the features, mm -hmm. right? So that's what Lime is doing. Uh, so now why this is called a perturbation based method is in order to even uh, fit a linear regression model there or any local linear model there, you are generating some perturbations of this initial data point where you started from, right? Yeah. So that's the, so typically these are the, this is what we call as perturbation based methods, okay? Mm -hmm. So now the attack, once you sort of know a key intuition becomes very clear and obvious, which is, so what we found as part of like, you know, analyzing what Lime is doing and so on. In fact, one of the PhD students that works with us uh, found this was the perturbations that are being generated by Lime are actually not the points that are in the data distribution. So these points look very different than the points that are actually in the data distribution that we care about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this could potentially be even off manifold data points or you know points that are like very far off because you're just massaging a point and assuming that you'll end up with a point that is sort of close enough right but that does not always happen so given that the perturbations that you're generating using lime are not really the points belonging to the in sample data distributions that's a key uh, you know point to uh, sort of remember now that that has happened or now that we realized that that was the case what we did was design a simple attack or like build this kind of a what we call as an adversarial classifier which does something you know, very sneaky, which is uh, this classifier, it, it looks at a point and then it basically decides if the point is in the data sample or if it's a perturbation. So it kind of makes this prediction as to is this point like generated by perturbation? Is this a synthetic data point or was this point in the data? Now, when a point is in the data, then this classifier says, yeah, let's use race or gender or any other undesired attribute that you could think of and make a prediction. But if a point is a synthetic data point, which means it's a perturbation, then look like you're super fair. Like don't touch any bad features, remain like super pristine, be very careful, like do something very clean and innocuous looking, right? So when you do that, what happens is, and when I give that classifier to Lime to explain, since Lime relies so much on perturbations, it thinks, oh, this model is doing fine on perturbations. I don't see race as you know an important feature when it's making predictions on those. So it will just assume that the model is not using race as a feature when making predictions. Whereas underneath what is happening is this like a wrapper. It's like an adversarial wrapper. You can think of that. It's kind of nicely uh, shielding. It's kind of shady behavior, for lack of a better word, by doing all the shady things on in-sample data points and then looking very innocent on any perturbation. So mm -hmm. that is the attack, which is throwing off line. And though the model uses race as the only and main feature in making predictions, because it looks like because it has an innocent behavior on the uh, you know perturbation data points, Lime is just assuming that it is using some very innocuous features when making predictions, and it can never catch this underlying racial behavior or the undesired behavior which uses race. Yeah. So the so the the setting kind of goes back to your setup at the very beginning of our conversation. You you, you know maybe you can't use a um, 
you know, a transparent model that you developed yourself. So you're getting a model from someone else kind of yep. on the shelf. Yeah. And the attacker in this case is whoever's creating the model. Yep. And uh, the scenario is kind of reminds me of Volkswagen gaming the EPA when the cars detected that they were, you know, being tested for emissions test. Right. They changed the way that they were, you know, throttled or whatever to make their emissions fall within spec. But yeah. you know, out on the road, they were, you know, yeah, exceeding the, the levels. Exactly. Yeah. This is, I think, a very good analogy. Yeah. That's pretty much what uh, this adversary who is designing this classifier is also doing. This off the shelf classifier is also doing. Mm -hmm. So the main idea is if people are just using, like, for example, Lime or SHAP to determine you know, are there any underlying racial or gender biases in this classifier, then the adversary can successfully fool them because they're able to fool these explanation methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And were you in, in this, this work, in this presentation, do you uh, propose any protections for this or are you identifying the, the attack? Um, yeah. The attack vector. Right. So that particular piece of work was just identifying the attack because that itself was, uh, I think, one of the initial works which even talks about attacks on explanation methods. Mm -hmm. But our ongoing work is definitely looking at how to sort of design these explanation methods which are robust to those attacks or which cannot be gamed to sort of you know make these kinds of attacks successful. So how to think about them. So that's an ongoing stream of research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so does uh, a method like Lime work if your perturbations are only producing or in the direction of kind of in distribution uh, results? Like, is that a direction that you're looking at or? Right. Yeah. So that's one of the directions we are looking at. Uh, but then you can also think of this as there are some two problems which are like two, two sides of a coin, right? So one is then you can basically make these perturbations more and more similar to your uh, data instances, right? So that will potentially subvert this kind of attack. So we can make a line plus plus where your perturbations look more and more similar to your data instances, yeah. right? So that's one thing. But then there comes another problem. That's a fix for this attack, right? But then there comes another problem, which is, uh, your explanations will start becoming more and more data dependent, right? So because if you have a data set, then the explanation that you build will only hold for that, for that data set. So which means if you change the data set or something, then the explanation is no longer going to hold. So that's another problem of this because you're making this explanation very tied to the data. Mm -hmm. So now how do we fix that is another problem. But I think this is again like a bit of a trade-off where you can think of this like a scale where the more you move to one side, you're probably creating some issues on the other side. So we are also looking at uh, sort of formalizing those trade-offs and like, you know, saying that, yeah, as you try to achieve more of, uh, you know, perturbations that look more and more similar to your data, yes, you subvert one attack, but then you are creating explanations that are only holding for your data. So is yeah. that good or is that bad? So like, what are the trade-offs between these two? Okay. Yeah. In your research, have you identified any other uh, similar types of attacks? Are there uh, others that have been proposed? Um, so again, as I said, like this is one of the initial ones, I think as a follow-up paper or uh, as a follow-up work, there's another team in Utah that has a recent ICML paper on specific attacks to SHAP. So that is a follow-up work, which again, sort of plays on uh, or builds on some of our earlier work. But I think so far there have mostly been uh, attempts at looking at like perturbation met based methods. So there is a lot of scope for open work on other kinds of methods, including radiant based methods and even you know global versus local, what needs to be attacked and what is most vulnerable in each of these and so on. So there's like a whole set of open problems that haven't really been addressed so far. So, yeah. mm -hmm. And are there any interesting connections between the the work that you're doing here and the broader research field of kind of adversarial machine learning attacks? You know, a lot of this is based on kind of perturbations and noise. And so there's at least yeah. a nomenclature overlap. Um, you know, does one have something to offer the other and vice versa? 
Yeah. Um, so yes, lot. Of, I mean, I think this work is actually uh, inspired by you know some sort of the adversarial machine learning literature. Mm -hmm. So there, the focus was more on. Uh, finding examples or data points which can throw off a classifier, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas here the focus is now let's find something which uh, throws off an explanation method. So like, I guess that way there is like a very clear parallel what adversarial machine learning was doing for classifiers and prediction models. We are trying to do that with explanations. So I guess that way there is like a pretty tight connection. And in fact, uh, you know, as I was saying about some ongoing work, which tries to address some of these vulnerabilities, like in perturbation methods or otherwise, uh, the way we also try to fix uh, the vulnerabilities and come up with a new explanation method is also inspired by how people think of adversarially robust classifiers in the adversarial machine learning literature. So just like people had this, uh, you know, let's first see what are the vulnerabilities where things are breaking down in terms of classifiers, then how can we develop a robust classifier? So the same thing is playing out in parallel in the explainability okay. literature. So yeah, there is a pretty clear connection. A lot of that ended up saying, you know, more regularization is the <laughs> approach. Is that going to be the answer here too? Uh, <laughs> that, maybe, that applies but, is equally. Yeah, but uh, I think so. The I guess the there are a couple of things though, right? So, for example, one thing is even beyond regularization, it's also about thinking about like formulations like maybe minimax, which is you know, sort of like thinking about the maximum possible error that you could have on like a variety of distributions that you want your model to work on, or like a variety of data sets you want your explanation to hold on, and minimizing that maximum error. So I guess those kinds of formulations are also very helpful apart from you know regularization and so on. So I think those ideas are useful to sort of flow from that community to the explainability community. Beyond that, I also am hopeful that there could be other interesting challenges with explainability. The reason why I say that is because there is as algorithms are being like increasingly used for various decisions like whether someone gets a loan right or whether you know someone gets a particular treatment or whether they are given a bail or not so there is an increasing sort of like call from both legal scholars and social sciences scholars to sort of make these machines also provide recourses to people. And when I say that, what do I mean is if I as a bank am using an algorithm and if I tell someone a loan is denied for you, I also need to tell them what needs to be changed in their profile so that they can come back and get a loan, mm -hmm. right? So they're making these algorithms more accountable, which means the gaming of these kinds of methods is going to be like very real. Like when you think of, you know, classifiers and some adversary sort of giving you an adversarial sample or example and so on. So I guess the danger of that somehow seems a little bit more limited to me than like when it comes to explainability where people are relying heavily on this and like things are moving increasingly in the directions that people are looking at these and making decisions of what models to use, mm -hmm. making decisions like whether a prediction is reliable or not. So as you're hitting more and more of these real world scenarios, I think, uh, I, well, we also need to be worried because the risk of these things being manipulated and gamed is very real and very high. But at the same time, I can see a lot more real world applications or like usages of these scenarios probably way more than, uh, you know, someone trying to change pixels in an image and so on, right? Yeah. So that's, while that's an interesting concept to think about, uh, you know, to solve a problem or like from an engineering perspective, technical perspective, here the social implications are very real. So I'm hoping that this would also bring with that more interesting technical challenges as well. Is there a GAN application here where you've got some model that's trained to try to fool your, um, some model that's, you know, you've got kind of these two adversarial models that are tried, that are trained to try to pick out, uh, you know, the out of right. distribution samples or something like that. And, you know, when the one model is trying to cheat the other. <laughs> 
for example. Yeah, no, I think we're headed there. I think some of even our <laughs> ongoing work is sort of headed there. Okay. Uh, but I guess the way in which sort of at least like, you know, me and my group or some of the other researchers are approaching this problem is uh, kind of trying to keep like a real ear to the ground uh, because a case where someone can build a classifier which can do something messy with in-sample data points and look very pristine and clean with these perturbations that the approach relies on is like a very realistic thing and it's not even like a super sophisticated attack if you think about it, right? Yeah. So we are trying to sort of at this point keep our ear to the ground and look at those most plausible scenarios and how to fix them. And then, of course, you know, some of these will automatically happen, which are definitely interesting from technical perspective and so on. Great. Well, Hima, thanks so much for sharing a bit about your presentation and your research. Yeah, thank you so much. This was, uh, yeah, this was amazing. I had a great uh, time talking to you. Same here. Same here. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on today's show, visit twimlai.com slash shows. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.